You will be uh, turning in your Bibles tonight to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 43 through 51 as we see uh, Jesus is going to be calling uh, two more disciples here in these uh, <clears throat> verses tonight. And uh, we'll also notice that Jesus is still calling uh, disciples today. And uh, while you're turning there, we do want to remind you that we will have in-person worship service at 6 o'clock Sunday night. We're going to ask you to sit in the same pew you sit at on Sunday morning. We're going to come in the same doors uh, that we come in on Sunday morning, still trying to keep safe and spread out, but uh, feel like we can get back to having uh, people in the service with us, with us on Sunday night as well. And of course, Sunday morning, Sunday night, we will continue the live stream for those who aren't comfortable coming yet or who can't come because of their work schedule. And so <clears throat> in John chapter 1, as we dig deeper into this, we talked about last week there is a path of discipleship. Once we enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's more than walking down the aisle and making a public profession of faith and being baptized and then just kind of disappearing into a pew somewhere, into a corner somewhere, but it's about growing, it's about maturing, it's about moving forward and finding where we are to serve in the church. There are different uh, gifts, different abilities that we are given <clears throat> that we can use in the church and outside the church to honor uh, Christ and to magnify his name. And what we'll see here in John chapter 1 in verses 43 through 51 is that Christ meets us where we are. You'll notice that with Philip and Nathaniel, he met them where they were and he transformed them and molded them and shaped them into the followers that they would become, the disciples that we would see in the early church there in the book of Acts. And <clears throat> I thought it was interesting when you think about Christ meeting us where we are and transforming us to follow him, and this idea that he calls his disciples. You remember the poster that was out there, the recruiting poster, where you had Uncle Sam and he was standing there, I want you in the United States Army. And they used that uh, for World War I recruiting and World War II recruiting, and then later on uh, <clears throat> as well, they used that as a recruiting tool for the United States Army and other branches of military. But the idea was this was a serious time and there were people who were needed to serve in the military. Well, what we have to understand as Christians today is this is serious times that we're living in. This is difficult times that we are living in. And whenever Jesus calls us and we accept the call, we surrender our hearts and our lives to Jesus Christ. We are surrendering our all to him and we are agreeing to serve him with all of our heart. And what we have to understand with that poster is it rallied a nation, right? It reminded us that we are Americans, that no matter what may be going on around us, no matter what enemy may be trying to attack us, we are Americans. We have a national identity and we as Americans are to defend the key ideas and principles that define our way of life. It's the same way with us as Christians in the church. We are to defend the key ideas and principles that define us as Christians. We are to stand upon the Word of God, the principles found in the Word of God, the doctrines found in the Word of God. We are to read those. We are to study those. We are to memorize those things. We are to grow and mature in the faith and be able to defend the faith. And Jesus actively searched for followers and called them to join him in his mission for the world, and that's what you see here. It says in verse 43, The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find Philip and say unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and said unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? 
Philip said unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall have, uh, see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. <clears throat> and so what we begin to notice here is that Jesus calls his disciples, and each one of these disciples had an encounter with Jesus. Philip had an encounter with Jesus. Nathaniel had an encounter with Jesus. Peter had an encounter with Jesus. Mary had an encounter with Jesus. All these people in Scripture that surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ had an encounter with Him. The first step in becoming a disciple of Jesus is encountering Him in a deep and meaningful way. It is more than just having a head knowledge, but it is a heart knowledge, surrendering all to Him. And he here's something interesting. Jesus, once again, kind of turning things uh, on their head, so to speak, in that time period. Most rabbis had people that were coming wanting to be their disciple, wanting to learn from them, where we see Jesus take the, taking the initiative and going to his disciples and picking his disciples, pursuing them. And that's what he's still doing today. He's still pursuing people. He's still pursuing disciples. He's still pursuing those who have not surrendered their lives yet to him. He had a mission, and that is to save the world from their sin. We had to have an encounter with Jesus. If we haven't had an encounter with Jesus, we're not a disciple. We have to have an encounter with Jesus. And people encounter Jesus in different ways. We see that in these verses. We see that he found Philip and said, follow me. And Philip followed Jesus. Now, Philip goes and he finds Nathaniel. He begins to witness to Nathaniel. Nathaniel then comes and has that encounter with Jesus and he still has some questions. He's still kind of uh, holding back. He's still not sure about who this man is that claims to be the Messiah. And Jesus said, I, I knew who you were. And I know who you are. You're a man without God. Now think about that. <clears throat> Here he is talking to Nathaniel, and we know who Jacob was, right, who became Israel. He was a trickster. He was a deceiver. And yet Jesus says, Nathaniel, I know that's not you. You're not a deceiver. You're not a trickster. You're not. And, and Nathaniel said, how do you know me? How do you really know me? That's the thing we have to understand about Jesus. He knows the real you. He knows the you that nobody else sees. And yet he said that about Nathaniel. Jesus said, I saw you over there under the fig tree, studying, reading scripture, talking about the Bible. Nathaniel said, I didn't, how did you know? And so he surrendered. He had that encounter with Jesus. And he said there that if you saw me under the fig tree and you knew what I was discussing and what we were talking about, you've got to be the Son of God. You've got to be the King of Israel. And Jesus, in verse 51, said, let me just go ahead and tell you, you're going to see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jesus there making a reference to Genesis chapter 8 and the ladder that Jacob saw with the angels. He said, I am the, I'm the ladder between heaven and earth. I am the gap between man and God. I'm going to bridge that gap there. I know there's a gap there. I am going to be the one that gives you access to God. <clears throat> As 
disciples, not only do we repent at the moment of salvation, but we also have to live a life of repentance because there's going to be times where we may get off course, where we may find ourselves getting off path and we have to repent. We have to turn back to God and get back on course. That's what repentance is all about is acknowledging that we were going in the wrong direction, that we were doing things the wrong way, and that we're going to turn around and we're going to go to God. We're going to follow God. It is the picture of what took place in the book of Acts with Saul, who later became Paul, right? That encounter that he had on the road to Damascus, he set out to slaughter the disciples of the Lord. He has desired letters to go to the synagogues and to persecute the people of the way. We know that Christians were not called Christians until Antioch. At that point, they had been called followers of the way. And he said in verse 4, after he has this light shine around him in verse 3, in verse 4, he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? In Acts chapter 9. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, in verse 6, we'll skip down, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto them, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. We know that Saul did what he was told to do there. He had that encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus. He repented, he acknowledged his sin, and he did what he was instructed to do. His life was completely transformed by that encounter with Jesus. It should be the same way with us. We encounter Jesus in different ways. Not everybody's going to have the same testimony, but followers of Jesus are simply those who respond to his call and then are transformed by Jesus. And once we are transformed by Jesus, we are to tell others. We are to disciple others. We are to evangelize the world. We don't take what we've learned. <clears throat> we don't take what we're studying and just keep it to ourselves, but we begin to discuss it with others. We begin to talk with others about it. That's what we see there in those verses that we started out looking at in John chapter 1 is that after Philip had that initial encounter with Jesus, he immediately went out seeking to tell people about Jesus. He didn't use any kind of excuse, well, I'm not educated enough, I don't know enough about the Bible. He just simply told Nathaniel what had happened in his life. That, that is an excuse that we must not allow ourselves to use, well, I can't witness because I don't know this or I don't know that. Whenever you're talking to somebody about Jesus and witnessing to somebody about salvation and about Jesus Christ, if they ask a question you don't know the answer to, it's quite all right to say, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll study it and I'll get back with you. It's okay to do that. We don't have to think that we know everything. Everybody doesn't have to think that we know everything. It's simply sharing our story, sharing our encounter and what Jesus has done for us. Nathaniel had a story to tell, much different than Philip's, but yet he had an encounter. He had a testimony. And what you'll see with Philip and Nathaniel and Peter and all these other disciples is that they continued to grow and mature. They understood there was a path for them to go down. They understood that there was a need for them to grow and to mature. And Jesus, when he called them, did not leave them alone, right? Right? For three and a half years there, he mentored them. He discipled them. He taught them. He performed miracles in front of them. He preached to them. And so they continued to grow. They continued to mature so that whenever Jesus died and rose again and ascended into heaven later on, the Holy Spirit revealed those things to them. And they remembered those lessons, they remembered those sermons, they remembered those teachings, and it helped them to grow and it helped them to mature, which is why they were willing to face persecution. How many of us are going to be willing to do what some of those churches in California are already having to do? 
<clears throat> meat, knowing that they could be charged with contempt of court and fined or put in prison or their pastor put in jail. And so that's what we begin to see in the book of Acts is these men were growing, these men were maturing. They couldn't help but tell what Jesus had done for them. And it didn't matter how many times they were in prison. It didn't matter how many times they were beaten. It didn't matter how many times they were told not to do it. They couldn't help but tell of what encounter they had had and how Jesus had completely transformed and changed their life. As Christians, at the moment of salvation, we are justified. <clears throat> That's the justification that we talk about. It's just as if we have never sinned, just as if we always obeyed. We are made right in the sight of God. Now, today, as Christians, we are in the process of sanctification. We are to continue to grow. We are to continue to mature. We are to understand that we have a mission, and that is to tell the world about Jesus. Yes, it is important for us to meet together. Yes, it is important for us to worship together. It's important for us to study the Bible together. It's important for us to pray together, all those things. But we are to take what we learn. We are to take what the Holy Spirit reveals to us. And we are to go out and to make a difference and to make an impact in our world. We are to be that light in the darkness, that city on a hill. And so we have been called. Jesus has called us to be disciples who make more disciples. May we understand that after we have had that encounter with Jesus, that he transforms our lives so that we can make a difference in our world. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now. We thank you tonight for your word. <clears throat> we thank you for the promises found in your word, Lord, we thank you for the direction that is given to us by reading your word, studying your word, praying over your word, and listening to the Holy Spirit's guidance. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be the disciples that you've called us to be. Thank you for that encounter that we had with you, and thank you that you continue to transform our lives. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to make a difference and to make an impact in the world around us. And we pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.